NCAA football team or not? I know everyone in their head is already saying yes, but let's wait. Let's see what the staff have to say. Uh, it's going to be a debate versus um, Andrew Loso, the co-president of BU Zoo. <laughs>
go through strenuous workouts uh, that not everyone can finish successful. The work you do will help you get bigger through your daily activity. Uh, excuse me, bigger, stronger, and faster. And this will pay off in confidence in everyday life. Walking through your daily activities with confidence can improve your mental outlook and, your, and help you ha live happier and healthier. While football does have the highest injury rate of any college sport, the injuries that are most likely to happen to a player are not severe. While baseball has a low injury, has the lowest injury rate of any sport, 25% of all the injuries in baseball are severe. I propose to provide players with helmets that have magnets. It sounds very funny, but uh, uh, at the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience on November 15, 2014, which is just a few days ago, they announced a new technology for football helmets that reduces force on the head during a collision. These helmets were tested by the National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment, which also tests NFL helmets. And they concluded that the helmets were safer than standard helmets. For example, at 48 inches, a standard helmet dropped would create a force of 125 Gs, while, magnet, while with the magnets, that drop can get below 100 Gs, and most, uh, most concussions happen over 100 Gs. Also, these magnets are safe for human health. A 30 to 60 minute MRI will create a magnetic field 15 to 30 times as strong as these helmets. There's nothing to worry about. Though magnets do attract metallic, metallic, metallic objects in the NFL, the NFL prohibits wearing jewelry during games and practices. These magnets can reduce the concussion rate by 80% of, of all of the 1.2 million football players in America, counting TV, high school, and college, and professional, reducing from 100,000 concussions to 20,000. These helmets will not change the appearance or intensity of the game, will only make it safer. Also, it would only cost fifty dollars on top of each helmet. And uh, Andrew's going to let you guys know some other stuff. Great, thank you. So I want to speak briefly because we don't use uh, too much more than our eight minutes. About a few more points that I think kind of contextualize the importance of a football program and the longevity and the success of a university. So we're all passionate advocators for our campus. We want to see that whatever we bring to our campus is going to have a positive impact. And I'm here to uh, provide information uh, to explain how a football program would increase affinity for a university, pride, and allegiance, which would have positive impact on the university setting. Now, when I did some research, I called the University of Michigan, and one of the first options that I was directed to her on the phone line um, asked me if I was a preferred donor uh, seat caller. And I was asked to press one. I did not do that, because uh, I'm not that. But this shows a very key aspect of the importance of having a football program. Our current donor rate for our alumni hovers a little less than 5%. Uh, and when I researched Penn State's, <laughs> alumni giving rate, it fell at about 25%. And now, you may ask, would a football program have a direct impact on a donor rate, uh, and why is that important to the university? It absolutely is important, and it absolutely does. 5% of a university's total ranking comes down to alumni satisfaction. And it is a very true qualitative assessment of the American culture that football provides the greatest form of allegiance. When I did a few more uh, Googles, I found that of the 20 top public universities uh, listed on US News and World Report, 24 of the top 20, you may think that's odd, but there is a lot of ties, 24 of the top 20 all have football programs. A lot of them are University of California. So the last thing I want to talk before we end is just to tie in a little bit of what my partners would discuss about the feasibility. <coughs> it is important. We know it's important. Will it be feasible? We discussed the implications and the potential for making money. Stony Brook University, 2013 to 14, revenue for their total athletic department, 25,000, 25,122,000 million, 122,000 expenses, 25,144. Albany, 16,378. And uh, Buffalo, 28,964 versus a 
28,960 expenditures. So our peer institutions operate football programs, all three of those operate football programs, at a level where they are fiscally responsible and that does not take into account any potential implications such as donor rate, affinity, uh, and ranking that comes down to implications such as alumni satisfaction. That's all we got. Also costs a lot of money. 
Um, if that location works, what effect in other areas? Could building it in that location have a negative have negative environmental effects? These are all questions we pose to those who want a football team. Also, what about uh, number three is alcohol consumption? Um, football stadiums, even college ones, serve alcohol. And while not all college stadiums serve alcohol, the number that they do has slowly risen. This this could be this could potentially lead to a rise of fights, obscene behavior, um, on our university grounds. Is that something we really want to promote? Um, okay, tailgating is also a major problem before football games. Something in which we do not want to promote. It is basically like a free game. It is something that will have many students drink. Uh, it it'll it will in increase in underage drinking. The majority of our students are underage. Therefore, a higher majority of underage students will most likely go to games. Go to the games. This will potentially lead to an increase in underage drinking. My last point, my final point is our brand. We are known for being an academic institution with strong academic groups and organizations. Uh, some examples are mock trials, speech and debate. Do we really want to conform to our competitors, Stony Brook, University of Albany, uh, University of Buffalo, uh, who all have football teams? We are unique in that we are known for our academics. For years, we have ranked higher than any other SUNYs, and maybe this is the reason. We put our academic programs before we put our sports. Many athletes are brought to universities and given scholarships not based on their academics. Uh, at Chapel Hill, a graduate student at UNC Green Park researched the reading levels of 183 UNC Chapel Hill athletes who played football or basketball from 2004 to 2012. She found that 60% read between fourth and eighth grade reading levels. Between 8% and 10% read below the third grade level. Therefore, having a football team could devalue our academic standards. Uh, this is the end of my debate, of my opening speech. I thank you all. Uh, D1 uh, D1 
you want single A schools that have to our conversation? And, uh, okay, so our plan, right? We're this big academic school. Originally, we were a writing school. Now we moved on to bigger, maybe not better things. Wait, okay, not bigger, better. Okay, let's back it up. We moved on to other things, and we expanded, and we have a great engineering school, great business school, whatever. There's plenty of great things that you could study here at Binghamton. But why is it that if we had a football team, we lose all of that. I don't think that's true. I think that if we had a football team, it would give us more school spirit and make us maybe want to go to class and maybe be a little bit happier because we got a game to go to or something. I don't know, you know? But like, we could have both. We could have academics and we could have athletics. There's no doubt about that. the academic reputation. Naturally, Binghamton University has an excellent reputation. Uh, we went up 10 spots this year, entering the U.S. News and World Report. Right? Anyway, we can all agree on that, uh, 98th to 88th. Um, the main point given by the opposition about the academic reputation is that football creates and founds a culture that detracts from the overall academic rigor of the school. I, as a student, uh, and my colleague agrees, feel that we could do both. We are one of two or three academic institutions in the country whose student association is as autonomous as we are, who controls a two and a half million dollar budget handed to us by formal check uh, from the administration to the students. And I think if any university can find it in themselves, in their academic rigor and in their intellect, to maintain their academic <coughs> standing, and also do uh, what needs to be done to increase our ranking and to increase our brand and our product of our university and have a football program. I feel that this university, like many other universities, can do that. So our opponent told us how bad tailgating was, and I know how much you guys disagree with that, but he, I do concede that, wait, 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 wait. I concede that, yeah, it probably would bring an increase in drinking and alcohol consumption, whatever, but we do have a police force on campus, and we're very lucky to have that, and we will have police policing the games and tailgates the entire game, so we don't have to worry about underage drinking. As long as you guys got your fake ID. <laughs> That's all we got. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I've just made great points, but there's ours in response. So let's talk about revenue, let's talk about cost. They talk about tailgating and the police force on campus, but what they don't tell you is if we had a football team and we had tailgating in a stadium anywhere near campus, we'd have increased costs for police. Would you like more police riding around campus telling you where you can be and what you should do and controlling your movements? I think not. The second thing, how many women in the crowd, all the females in the crowd, raise your hand. Please. Title IX. How many of you have heard of Title IX? You are not a female. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Title IX? Started in 1979, right? Legislation to give females equal access and opportunity to sport. If we added a football team, it's a minimum of 85 scholarships. In addition to those 85 scholarships to be compliant with Title IX, we have to offer 85 spots for women to be able to participate in sports. So now not only do you have the increased cost of adding football teams, but you have the increased cost of adding opportunities for women to be able to participate, right? So that's something that our friends in the excitement of football are forgetting about the facts. The last piece that I'll mention is when they talk about revenue, 
and they talk about the money that's brought in from the 20 Division One A programs that have earned a profit, what they don't talk about is the overall athletic department. So yes, the football teams at Texas, at Michigan, Ohio State are making money, but not every athletic department that has a football team making money is actually breaking even themselves. And so do we want to run a further deficit here at Binghamton when we're already over $11 million in order to start a football team? Next, spirit. Yes, I agree. Worked at football schools, actually was a student athlete at the University of Albany. Can it add spirit? 100%. But is that the only way that spirit can be added to a campus? By drinking in a parking lot before an athletic contest? I think not. Help. If football is the only way to get healthy, I have a women's basketball player that came to watch the debate tonight. She's over in the corner. And I would argue, I would argue that that young lady over there has, is in as good cardiovascular shape as any football player that you can bring in. What about swimming? What about track and field? There are many ways that you can get in shape. You think 300 pound linemen that eat all your food in the dining hall are actually in shape people? They may try to bully you for their food depending on how much money they have on their meal card. Uh, confidence. All I got to say about confidence is if you know anything about college football, you have to look no further than Florida State and Jameis Winston. Last year, the Heisman Trophy winner, who was suspended for a half of a game for standing on a table in the middle of campus, similar to our tables here, yelling obscenity. Is that really who you want in class with you? Is that really who you want to spend time with you? And I see some people shaking their head, yes. <laughs> so James says that to you. Let's talk about the new helmets briefly while I got about a minute and 30 seconds. I've done the same research as, as the advocates were doing. And what they won't tell you is that Rydell, the helmet maker that they're referring to, has come out and said, and this is a direct quote from the CEO of Rydell, diagnosing concussions is for doctors and trainers. Right now we can reduce the forces of impact and that's a good thing. Are we saying that concussions, because we're reducing the amount of them, are still good? What about the long-term damage that it has on individuals? Is that something that we really want to bring onto our campus, the increased medical costs? Also, what they don't tell you is that the NCAA has just settled on July 29, 2014, a $75 million lawsuit to pay players that have had repeated impact rotational force concussions, and whiplash. So while the helmets may be great, they still don't eliminate concussions. So it makes football safer, but it doesn't make it completely safe. So please don't be fooled by that. The last thing that I'll address is our brand. As the person responsible for the academic well-being of our student athletes here at Binghamton, Penn State, they reference Penn State. Do we want a football program that is gonna grow in stature where our institution's sole focus is to protect the coach and the program, or do we really want to keep the integrity of our institution? North Carolina Chapel Hill is the flagship institution for the North Carolina State University system, similar to Binghamton in the SUNY system. If you know anything that happened at Chapel Hill, there's 3,500 students that have taken what they call no-show classes. They are currently being sued at Chapel Hill right now by students um, who graduated because they feel that their degrees have been devalued. The one reason that you come to Binghamton is because of the academic rigor, and you know when you leave here you will have a valuable degree. Are you willing to give that up to add a football program? That's the question I leave you with before we go to our program. something that could get you in shape and replace it by other things that can get you in shape it just leaves you with less things to do you know yeah, yeah. And so what the opponent has basically stated in his overarching sentence that there are 
detractors uh, that would come with having this football program that deal with the culture of our institution um, and also the <laughs> academic standing of the institution. However, um, I remind you again with information already presented um, that the top 20, top 24 public institutions as uh, ranked by US News and World Report, 24 of the 20, again, all have football programs. And just to finalize the um, caveats of increased drinking, the culture that detracts from the academics, again, <laughs> I say to you as a student, I feel that if 24 of the top 20 public universities can do it, I don't see how we're any different I don't see how we're any less intellectual. I don't see how we need to be protected by people who know better than us about what's better or worse for our bodies, and I think that we can do it as well. Okay, so also our opponent mentioned uh, a statement from Rydell, and I was not referring to Rydell at all. I was referring to uh, I can get you his name, he's an engineer, and I wasn't referring to the helmets, I was referring to magnets being placed into the helmets. Not a... Anyway, thanks guys. Thank you so much. Many more times 
to see if it actually works. To, to, to that point, though, you bring up a really good point. So that's a case study in how to run a tailgate that can be run successfully, right? So we run one of them, and we run it at the start of the <coughs> soccer game where we see maybe 4,000 people, right? If you're talking about football, we're talking about upwards of 15,000 to anywhere at the highest level, like Michigan, over 100,000 people. So you have to take the size of the tailgate, the number of issues that you see, and then make it larger proportionately, and then times it by six. Because there's six home football games in the average season. So you bring up good points, but it's just some other things for you to think about. I like a good tailgate, too. So. I don't think we're just dumb jocks either, because we're not. Um, I think that that is an indicator of the success and intellect of our students and alums. And I think that that would perpetuate if we were to increase the numbers, because they're the same people who came from the same roots. All right, next question. Yep. I noticed that the opposition side stated that, both, that building a stadium would have a negative effect on our environment, but uh, like what comes along with that is also that the stadium could be built with environmentally friendly materials as well as uh, aesthetics that would please the people that drive by them in the area that they set. So, what about that? So, that we'd be using would be more expensive. That's why. <laughs> we don't we don't argue that there are environmentally friendly ways to do it, but you also have to remember our campus is built on a nature preserve. How many campuses around the country do you know that are built around the nature preserve? Even if we put the stadium over there, it probably, that area probably would not be big enough, like Andrew, I have not measured it, but it probably would not be big enough to fit the type of stadium that you all would like based on your responses. And then I think the, the other piece to it is, what goes on over there already? Recreation and intramurals. So for all of you that aren't student athletes, a member of the athletic department, where do you go to play in those fields now? So now we're displacing a group of people to build a stadium that houses 85 young men. Is that really the right cost-benefit analysis? Just a question in the <clears throat> But why does that mean that that area has to solely be used for, uh, for football uses? Why can't it be used for recreational use as well? That would be peerless, wouldn't it? I can, tell you, I can tell you from my experience working at every level of Division I, you will not get access to the football stadium. Not gonna happen. Because if the grass gets torn up or anything like that, then all of a sudden we have increased costs for repairing the field. So you're, they're not gonna let you run flag football out there or anything like that, unfortunately. But it's a good point. But I believe that there are still other areas that could be used for recreational use on campus. Okay. All right, next question. You guys, make sure, you're, <laughs> make sure your question is sort of asking both sides something, not just like, not just the opposition. I know everyone loves football, but yeah. Okay. Um, why does the stadium have to be so gigantic? Why doesn't it just be like a field with some bleachers and it's easier to have a complete set of people to cheer the team on? Why does it have to be the 80-something thousand you were mentioning? I'll let them mention that first. Uh, well, I, I, I think that's relevant because I was, when I was thinking of who has football, well, Class D high schools have football. And Binghamton University does not have football. And so I think that the only, you know, logical response would be if we, um, you know, the more money we spend in the state, the more we spend on the, the facilities, operations, um, that money will, will be theoretically made up in um, ticket sales. But I would certainly advocate for not an 80,000 person stadium. I would advocate for a stadium that's more the size of like New Albany Stadium, um, which I, again, do not know the number of that, but I've seen it because I've been up there. Um, and I think that based on our size and uh, where we want to go with the program, uh, we, we do not need that. 80,000, 100,000 person Michigan style set up. Um, so University of Albany Stadium is pretty big, it's pretty large. If we're gonna compare a college stadium to a high school stadium, um, we have over 16,000 students. 
Um, and a, st a football stadium, like like my partner said, can can house up to about a hundred thousand a hundred thousand people, almost. So if you're going to compare high school, you live in a small town, you have maybe even four hundred people at your high school. So if you're comparing high school to college stadiums and high school football to college football, it's much bigger. College college football is much bigger than high school football. So it's there's no comparison. Yeah. All right. So I kind of wish that the opposition stressed a little bit more. So you talked about like school spirit and alumni donations, and you're saying that football would raise that, but basically the idea is that we have other sports and we don't have that. And the reason is because these sports that we currently have don't uh, pull results. They're not very good in the D1 division. They're not. They're just not pulling results. And so why would we throw money at a football for shitty teams? And throw millions at that if it would just end of the day suck. We're just spending so much money on the stadium and the parking, and it would just suck. When we could just make one of our poor teams good, and that would make people care about it. Well, I'll take the lead on that. Um, wow! <laughs> Premier Public University students. Um, the, it's, I think, it comes down to the realities of American culture. Um, you're not going to sell 15,000 tickets to softball, you're not going to sell 15,000 tickets to swimming. I swam for six years middle school and high school, and didn't see more than 25 people come out to my swim meets. And I understood that, because that's just the realities of what constitutes, de facto, your spectator sports. And so, we as advocates for our institution would not found the program uh, with the sentiment that it would be a crappy, bad team. We would found it with the high hopes that it would be a good team and that we would do something within our limits and our, our reason to uh, found a team that in American culture does attract the big, big numbers. And we need to do football because, again, just in terms of what happens in culture, in reality, the football brings the people, uh, the basketball brings the people, uh, but the other sports, the, the, the spectator numbers decrease significantly um, after that. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Everything you said is spot on. Um, one thing, one thing that we want to, that, that I just want to talk about. He talks about uh, football being uh, our Americans. Americans watch football, but baseball is also one of America's pastimes. Um, people at Binghamton University they don't watch baseball. We have we have a good baseball team. In fact, it isn't just that it's sports. It's because our institution is an academic institution. Um, this is what we base most of our resources off of, academics, not sports. And that's why a lot of our students come to our school because for academics. They don't really come here for sports. This isn't, we don't emphasize sports at this university as much as we do academics. Uh, I'll just make one quick point to, to the shitty comment. <laughs> no, I'm not mad at you. I, I actually, I appreciate and applaud your honesty. What I would say to you is this, though. The difference between football and every other sport has actually been researched. It's what they call the Flutie effect. You can Google it. You can look it up online. Uh, a lot of people have spent time researching this. When Doug Flutie at Boston College threw that Hail Mary and they ended up beating Miami, the number of applications at the institution rose tremendously. Um, basketball cannot do that for you. It will have a similar effect, but it will be much smaller. And we saw that when our men's basketball team went to the NCAA tournament. If you look at the research, the next year at Binghamton, the applications were up. But if you add football to that, to Andrew's point, it will magnify that effect to a whole different level. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but at this type of institution, there is a cap on the type of growth that you will end up having um, without football. <coughs> So you're saying the issue is that we're going to have too many people applying to our school? I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's issue. the yeah. issue at all. This is being fair. Yeah. No, I, I'm being honest to his yeah. comment. What I would say to your point, though, is do you want a number of people applying to your school, or do you want quality applicants? I want quality applicants. Next question. <laughs> don't a lot of smart people watch football? Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, we gave a tour. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I worked as a tour guide, and actually, my co president of the BU Zoo, which works with School Spirit, uh, gave a tour to a student. It was a very bright student, asked a lot of questions. At the end of the tour, um, he said, Okay, I'm deciding between here and Yukon. Can you tell me if Binghamton has School Spirit? The kids accepted to Binghamton. So, if we want you, we want you. Okay. Uh, we accept about 30% of our applicants. Um, and because my co president advocated, uh, that we do have school spirit, and it takes uh, this cool form, we get people out to these games, we have this event, and this and that. Um, the student did end up choosing Binghamton over UConn, and uh, my co-president actually sees him on campus now. And so, um, that really is a testament to how smart that kid was, but it is a testament to the, the strength that you could find with spirit in terms of your enrollment management. Alright, I'll take, uh, take two more questions. <coughs> Um, when you guys are projecting profitability, do you guys take into account how much more alumni donations be um, contributed to the football team? And if so, like, what kind of the number would you be looking at? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to calculate that because there's no like <coughs> set number that someone's going to donate. You know, so I, I don't know if I could actually answer your question. I'm sorry. I just quickly should give them some time to respond. Um, you know, when, when I looked at, I gave the example of Penn State, 25% of their alums donate um, versus our 5%. Uh, to be honest, I, I cannot quantitatively pinpoint if that is the football, uh, but I can say on, again, a more qualitative level that, you know, it, it's not a, a far leap in logic to understand that um, pride and spirit translates into donor and alumni allegiance. And so that's kind of the logic where I, I, I base that on. And again, I do not have the numbers. All I know is that we, there is a, a lot to be desired in terms of our, our, our giving rate, uh, which translates directly into our ranking, which is important for all of us in terms of our advocacy at the university when we're getting jobs and all of that. And so I don't know that the, the uh, I can't really pinpoint it, but I do have the logic for, for group that. Well, I can just say that if you look at the Big Ten, those are the main 10 uh, NC single A teams. They have, their alumni contribute, some of their alumni contribute over $25 million, but you could take that in any way. We don't, there's no evidence ever saying that one, that it's because um, they have a football team. So yes, the Big Ten uh, have alumni that, that they give them a lot of money in sponsorship. But is that really because they have a football team? That's a question that, that we don't know. Well, really what you're talking about is correlation, and that's what Andrew's talking about. There has been correlations drawn to increase alumni giving for schools that have football. But the key, and what I didn't have time in the rebuttal to, to point out, is no one has talked about the subsidies. All of the 20 schools that, that have made a profit still take some kind of state subsidy. The public institutions are talking about still take a state subsidy. That means they're getting revenue from their state in order to run their athletic department. So even though they show a profit, when you take out the subsidies and you take out the expenses, you're looking at seven to 10 division one athletic departments that actually produce any revenue. Cool, all right, uh, last question. Yeah, Ben. It seems unrealistic for us to build a stadium on campus because of increased police presence, underage drinking, and just lack of space. I'm just curious how both sides would feel about building a stadium off campus. Like, we're in Vestal, but we're SUNY Binghamton, so we bring all the stadium downtown. Yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool if we had a, uh, a big dome downtown. Why not? That'd be awesome. Yeah, I, I don't, we really can't make an argument to that. I think it would have to be, um, it would have to be somewhere else. The only concern would be, and not being the opposition, the only concern would be the amount of driving that you as students would have to do after consuming alcohol. So I would venture to say an indirect effect of building that stadium downtown or off campus would probably be an increase in uh, checkpoints, DWIs, DUIs, those kinds of things. I would speculate. 
and maybe an increase in buses, which sounds funny, but like, you know, the school would probably have to buy, had to move all these kids from the stadium, yeah. from the school to the stadium, and from the stadium to the school, because we don't want to be a school known for how many kids get drunk and go driving. Yeah. And I do concede that that would be a, you know, if, if, if our argument on this side is strong at this point, I would probably be a little bit of a tractor if we had to do it off campus. I think that if, if we couldn't find a way, maybe we, you know, reevaluate um, our, our <laughs> spatial nuances of where Murray Hill Road divides the ITC, maybe some parking lots in the area, we create a parking garage, which I think is a necessary thing That's apart from football, um, then I think that the, the, our strongest argument on this side would be to actually have it remain on campus. So. Yeah, the number one issue would be the stadium. It'd actually be parking, because you have to have a place to house all the cars that people take to get to the stadium. And so that really takes away from the aesthetics as well. So that's a really good point. All right, guys. Um, I know a lot of you guys still have questions. So Ed and Andrew, I think they're still going to hang around for a little while, so you can go up to them and ask any questions. I think I accidentally reset this. So even if you got your card scanned, <laughs> <laughs> you can go back to me and get your card scanned. <laughs> so, um, great.